All right, let's get started. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we've been working our way through First Peter this year, probably a lot of last year as well. And we're in the section where last week we just heard that Jesus is coming back, and we're going to have to give an account to him. And uh, we come then to our passage in First Peter 4, 8. It says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Although by this time I should be used to it, I still am surprised when, in talking with normally intelligent human beings, I, I come across this expectation that the finest, most valuable, and noble things of life should be easy and should be achieved by doing what comes naturally. Because if they're valuable, they're not usually easy. And if they're significant, they're probably going to be difficult. Breathing is a vital thing in life, and for most people, it's easy. Um, eating is another one of those things that is a relatively easy task, but there's nothing like noble or praiseworthy about it. The thing that most people do naturally results in wood, hay, and stubble. Stuff that's easy to get, but fairly insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But the things that are noble and difficult and valuable require effort that normally does not come naturally. It follows that if love is one of the chief things, or the chief thing, the greatest of these is love, in 1 Corinthians 13, then that would also be something that doesn't come naturally, but is really rather difficult and requires much effort. And it only really achieves God's intended purposes if it's done God's way. So that's why Peter says, above all, in light of Christ's return, and the fact that you're going to have to give an account to him, keep fervent in your love for one another. And then a phrase that I think is hugely misunderstood, love covers a multitude of sins. This is a quotation from Proverbs 10, 12, the next verse down there, where... Uh, probably Solomon wrote, hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers over or overwhelms all wrongs. Uh, that word for wrong, sometimes transgression or sin, is often used of rebellion or a breach of fidelity. And when you encounter this breach of fidelity or when you are wronged, love doesn't stir up hatred and dissension over it, but it actually does something it can be translated, buries it. Um, in the context of Proverbs 10, I might not get back to it, there's many words talking about speech and covering, and you go back and look at that on your own if I don't get to it. Back into the New Testament, 1 John 4.16, John writes, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. And much of Christendom is really big on the fact that God loves us. And this is wonderful. If it were not so, we'd be dead. And then it says, because of that, we should love one another. But in between, it says, God is love. God has chosen to define himself by a characteristic called love. He has also chosen to define himself as holy and just, big three. But in light of the fact that God is love, he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And the idea is we're supposed to live in love. Not just any kind of love, but God's kind of love. Now, a problem arises in that people define love as a feeling. They use Hollywood to define it, or romance novels to define it, or their imagination to define it, or their needs to define love. But we need to use the scriptures to define love. It's not a feeling. It's an action. It's commanded. And I'm not sure if you can command feelings. You might be able to. It's hard to command emotions, but actions are very easy to command. Roman number one tells us that fervent love is commanded in light of giving God an account to God. It's not a suggestion. Ah, uh, you know, if it's convenient, try yeah, to love. Uh, it's not a good outline point. It's a command to which we will have to give an account. James 2.8, which has a lot of good parallels, or James has a lot of good parallels to our passage, says, if you really fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. You'll know it's one of the great commandments, one of the great two, it embodies all the law, but
But look at the expectation. The expectation is that you would fulfill it and that you would do it. And if you do it, you do it well. So it's not just a nice guideline, it's a command that's expected to be obeyed. Paul says a similar thing in Galatians 6.1. And I'm going to quote this from the CEV because it has a, puts a nice little spin on it that I think is in accord with the original. My friends, you're spiritual. So if someone is trapped or overtaken in a sin or fault, you should gently lead that person back to the right path. But watch out. Don't be tempted yourself. Verse 2, you obey or fulfill the law of Christ. That isn't the original. When you offer each other a helping hand. The expectation of both of these apostles is that we would obey or fulfill this law. That we would demonstrate towards them a kind of love that God requires of us. Fervent love is something that is difficult. Fervent love, as you heard Garrett mention earlier, is self-sacrificially doing what is in others' highest interest. Let's think about where that great verse, John 3.16, takes us. It says, God so loved the world. Do you think God felt nicely towards the sinners that were rebelling against him? He said, oh, you cute, cuddly little rebels, I just can't wait to squeeze you. <laughs> no. <laughs> God, you know, remember what happened last time? God kind of looked at the world and saw it sin. Did the words flood mean anything to you? <laughs> and it comes back, God does not really like um, folks who rebel against him, but he does love them, love them enough to sacrifice his son to die for them, because that was in their highest interest. So, fervent love is commanded, oops, I'm losing my vision here, because our response to another's sin is usually not to love them. When someone confronts us with their sin, they normally do it by slapping us, <laughs> saying nasty things about us, harming us in some way. And what would our response naturally be? What would be the easy, natural thing to do? They retaliate, vengeance, say nasty things. Anything but love. But God says that should be our response and it should be a fervent kind of love. So instead of criticizing, rejecting, and withdrawing, what we need to do is draw on God's grace to accomplish God's purposes in that individual's life. You'll notice that this love is towards one another. And normally the people that cause us the most grief are the people that we know the best. You know, the fact that someone's doing something in another country doesn't personally affect me. But Trying to love others that are close can be pretty difficult. So it's commanded, I'm going to have to give an account to God in terms of how I've loved those who are around me. Fervent love is not something that you do naturally because it's preceded, Roman numeral 2, by fervent purity. It's rare that you hear people who advocate love also advocate purity unless you're looking at a teen sexuality conference. But <laughs> you cannot fervently love others unless you have fervently purified yourself. And Peter's admonition in chapter 4, verse 8, was preceded by 1 Peter 1, 22, where he instructed, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls so that you have a sincere, fervent love for the brothers, then fervently love one another from the heart. If you just go out and try to love someone, it's, you're going to fall on your face. Because it never really works out that well. Unless your heart and motives are pure, and your needs are not gathered from the other person responding to you, your love is going to be a disaster. Um, I have a little thing blurb here. Obedience purifies. Without purified desires, our love is self-serving rather than other-serving. Most people love because I'm expecting something in return. And in a marriage, yeah, that's actually pretty valid. But what if you don't get something in return? 
do you continue to love? If you don't have a purified heart, you won't. I was talking to a guy at a, a Passover lap when we were in New York, when he was in New York. Although we didn't know each other, we knew of each other. And I ran into him, and he's involved in this setting where he says there's some people in leadership. And he talks about them as deeply spiritual people who know the Bible a lot. And he talks about a guy who uh, was chairman of a board. And he said that um, the guy has not had a loving relationship with his wife or intimacy with her in 12 years. But he's this deeply spiritual guy. And now he's found someone that loves him. Things like your local neighborhood choir director, that's normally the way these things work out in bigger churches, <laughs> who's like a drink of water to this man who is dying of thirst. And his love is not really a purified love because he hasn't obeyed the truth first. And as a result, he's going to wreck his life and everyone else's life involved in the situation. Fervent love has got to be preceded by fervent purity or you get yourself in lots of trouble. His interest or anyone's interest in loving another becomes self-serving unless God is meeting your needs. So it says, we will serve others caring more for what they think of us rather than what Christ thinks of us and basically become spiritual prostitutes. We give to others expecting them to give back to us. We sell out Christ to be able to get them to love us. If we only love within our own comfort zone, we also fail to do what is another's best interest. And if we just do what is easy or causes the least amount of grief, we forfeit eternal glory and wind up in mini-idolatry. Mini-idolatry is when you kind of worship something that's other than God because he gives you something back that you want. A purified heart only wants to please God and then is then able to look towards others and what can I give them? How can I serve them? And you can always tell that it's a faulty love because when you don't get anything back or you get grief thrown back in your face or people mock and spit at you when you're hanging on the cross for them, they'll respond incorrectly. So if you don't have the perfect purity, um, you should probably stay out of the field of love. But since we are judged in how we love, you need to develop the purity so that you're loving others and you can focus only on their best interest. So when Peter gives this command in chapter 4, he expects that his readers had followed what he said in chapter 1. They had purified themselves by obedience to the truth. Otherwise, you'd have a hypocritical, hypocritical love, and uh, it's going to backfire. Another thing I noticed about this verse that I'd like to draw your attention to is that this fervent love is reciprocal. Do it with one another, and they're supposed to love you back. So it's supposed to be reciprocal, but if it's not reciprocal, see the point before. And a lot of people have a three-year-old concept of love. Your basic three-year-old, after they can't get what they want from the parental unit, sticks out their little lower lip, pouts, a few tears start coming at the two of the eyes, and they say, you don't love me. Why don't I love you? Because you're not giving me what I want. Think about that. Adults do that. 30-year-olds do that. 60-year-olds do that. We think that if we don't get what we want, somebody doesn't love us. Oh, I don't want to go to the hospital and get a needle. I don't want to go to the hospital and get a needle. You don't love me if you're taking me to the hospital and get a needle. If you don't get the needle, you'll die. You don't love me. <laughs> <laughs> If we don't care about what the other person wants, and we don't care about their feelings, and we do what's in their best interest, they'll fuss and complain. So we need to care, and we'll talk about the caring part later, but ultimately we need to do what's in another's best interest. Now it's really hard to care about how they're feeling when they're throwing rocks at you. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> when you're busy dodging jagged rocks, it's really hard. And a lot of people bring judgment upon themselves, both interpersonally, because of their failure to respond correctly when they don't get what they want. Two passages, um, even though I spent a lot of ink on these, they're 
not major points, but they are significant points. And a first John and James might illustrate this. It says in first John three sixteen under Roman number three, this is what how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, even when we're throwing rocks at him. We ought to lay down our life for random people that we encounter on the street. Oh no, it didn't say that. It said we ought to lay down our life for our brothers. I guess sisters would probably fit in there. And then, as John elaborates and illustrates, he says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of Christ be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but in actions and in truth. And the idea behind this, the principle behind this, is if you have what someone needs and you don't give it to them, you don't love them. James makes the same point. 2 1. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? And then a couple chapters later in 417, he says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do, and doesn't do it since. So, lots of people in Christendom take a look at this and say, we need to start a soup kitchen. Maybe, maybe not. But the principle that is applicable everywhere, regardless of where it is, is we need to be meeting each other's needs. If we have what the other person needs, and because of our desire for comfort or security or not being rejected or caring more about what they think about us and what God thinks about us, we keep our mouth shut. We sin. If you know that someone needs something and you have what they need and you don't do anything about it, you're not loving indeed the truth. By the way, don't misunderstand you know, just with words. Because most frequently, the thing that a person needs is words. In fact, most conceptions and things that categorizations of love, it's the words that you speak. And of course, how you say them also helps too. So this fervent love is supposed to be reciprocal. We are supposed to love one another, and people are supposed to love us back. And if that happened, it would be great. If we said, you know, I noticed that you know, you're struggling with this, and you know... Um, that the truth says this, and the response back was, oh, I'm so glad you told me that. Thank you. Bless you. It'd be wonderful. But instead, you address needs that people have, and they say, there's no problem. You're crazy. Okay, rock number one just got thrown. <laughs> and if you say, well, yeah, there, is, there actually is, and then there becomes a whole skill war. That's not reciprocal love. And one of the things I've observed over the years, whenever there is an interaction over a person's needs, and things get nasty, the person who is seeking to address the need gets accused of not being loving. When in fact the person whose needs are being addressed is disobeying the command to love. Because if someone tries to love you, you have the responsibility to love them back. So if you don't like the way they say something, and you think they've offended you, well now the shoe is on your foot to demonstrate love to them. Both parties have the responsibility for love. In marriage, people say, oh, he or she isn't meeting my needs. Well, are you meeting their needs? Well, I'm not going to meet their needs until they meet my needs. Well, is that what God does with us? Is that the kind of love we're supposed to give? If you know the good and you don't do it, you sin. In Roman numeral 3, the text, we need to demonstrate towards others the same love we desire or demand from them. I demand that you speak to me a certain way and do a certain thing just so I feel a certain way. Well, gee, you just violated love. <laughs> because you're not doing it the reverse. When we fail to get from others what we think we ought to have, we fail to give them what we owe them, bringing double judgment upon ourselves. Why double judgment? Number one, because you're not doing what Christ commanded. Uh, initially, in terms of what you owe them, and number two, you're failing to love them back. 
So fervent love is supposed to be reciprocal. And it's the height of hypocrisy to demand that others fervently love me when I don't fervently love them. And you can't fervently love unless you are fervent about purifying yourself. Because love comes from the heart. And one of the ways to be fervent about purifying yourself is to recognize when our time on earth here is up, we have to give an account to God and how we've done this. Now, the preaching ends and the bedling starts. <laughs> the fruit of fervent love. What actually happens if we are fervently loving others? Well, let's start looking at that verse up top. The verse at the end that I said people tend to phrase it, frequently misunderstood. Above all, keep a fervent love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So, I actually started developing this sermon a couple weeks ago, and before I actually got as in-depth into it as I wanted, trying to present the point that love overlooks the flaws and faults and sins of others. And while that is true, it is not what this passion says. Huge books, huge volumes of books are written saying, oh, you know, if you're going to have a good relationship with someone, you need to never criticize them. Dale, thank you, Dale Carnegie. How to win friends and influence people. Or you need to pretend that their flaws don't exist. It's that guy for 12 years did until he finally snapped. This phrase does not say keep a fervent love for each other by covering over their sins. It does not say keep a fervent love for each other so you will cover over their sins. Actually, I could say that if you understand this purposely. It says keep a fervent love for each other because love covers a multitude of sins. So what's the relationship between fervent love and this multitude of sin thing? Well, there's another New Testament passage that quotes this uh, proverb in the book of James, at the very, very end, the very last verses of James, chapter 5, that sheds a little light on it, and you can see that they are both very parallel. James 5.19, under Roman number 4 in your passage, the last words James speaks, it's very interesting, two of the earliest books of the uh, New Testament are Peter and James, and he ends on this note, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, is it possible for believers to wander from the truth? Say it isn't so. It's so. Sorry. And if someone should bring him back, is it possible to bring him back? Nah, not in my experience. <laughs> yes, it is possible. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner, the one who wandered from the truth, the brother and sister who was walking and then walked wrong, from the error of his or her way, will save that person's soul, mind, will, and emotions, from death. And in the process, cover over a multitude of sins. Uh, someone said in one of their elaborations of this verse that there are a couple religions that basically say they use this as the basis for soul, worthy, soul winning. You need to go out and turn people from their way so you cover over your own sins. Wrong. <laughs> Obviously Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin, and that's not the issue. The issue of death is loss of dominion, rulership, glory, and all that other stuff. But if you turn a person from their way, the end result is you sweep a lot of sins under the rug. Nope, that's not true either. Covering a multitude of sins is not sweeping them under the rug. But a lot of Christians do that. I ran into a guy who just uh, started a ministry somewhere a couple of years ago. And he said, oh, it's been two years. I'm just pulling up one rug after another. 
You know, it's like, ah, what's under here? What's under here? It's only been over two years. Because the previous guy who had been there over a dozen years didn't want to deal with sins in the church. He just swept them under the rug. And the church is infected and dying as a result. And this guy's in there. I don't suspect that his ministry is really appreciated by a lot of folks. But I think Christ thinks well of his ministry because he is getting rid of sin. So, what is this covering a multitude of sins? At the end of Roman rule 4, I've given you the five or six other places in the scripture where it comes from. And uh, it talks about the waves overwhelming, over, covering over the boat when there was a storm. Jesus, don't you care? Um, it talks about things that are hidden being made manifest on the day of judgment. In Luke 8, that's uh, 10, 26 of Matthew. In Luke 8, 16, it talks about a lamp being stuck under a bushel basket. Maybe setting it on fire. <laughs> um, in Luke 23, 30, when judgment is announced, people are actually begging for the hills to cover them and protect them. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, it uses the concept of something being veiled. So, what, what is the correct understanding of this word? Um, are we supposed to just throw a veil or a rug over other people's sins? Is that fervent love? Let's say I just said, saw sin. I, I, you know, let's cover it over. Pretend it's not there. I don't see it. Under the basket. What sin? I don't see any sin. You see any sin? No, I don't see any sin. No sin. What happens to that person come judgment day? They stand before Christ, and Christ says, <laughs> What's under the rug? What rug? Lifts it back up. Oh boy, are you in trouble. Is that fervently love? Being someone? To know that they're being sent to judgment, carrying with them this massive amount of unchrist like behavior, thinking, actions, attitudes, and values, and it's too late to do anything about it? I cannot figure out how that's love. So, I conclude it isn't. Love overwhelms the sin. It actually is wiping it out. In light of the fact that you're going to have to stand before God and give an account, fervent love needs to be exercised towards one another. Because fervent love overwhelms a multitude of sins. It doesn't overlook them. It overwhelms them. Yeah. Ah, uh, we'll get there. I took a little deeper <laughs> into Proverbs 10, and I found out that this word for cover, which is, you know, the early Jewish mindset of the early Christians would have been fully in accord with the uh, original intent of Proverbs 10. I found out that this word for cover originally meant to plump up, like plumping up a pillow to fluff it up. And then, by extension, it became to fill in a depression. And then, by extension, it meant to put clothes over something and to make it so it is no longer seen or there. And then, as the word gets brought into the New Testament usages and some of the Greek thought, let's think about this thing about the light in the bushel. If you have a bushel basket and you stick it over a candle, what happens to the candle? It goes out. Yeah, it's rendered of no effect and it goes out. So there's this concept of like a boat that's overcome by water does no longer serves as function as a boat. It's like it's gone. So it, it has this concept of getting rid of the thing that frequently is not used in uh, our modern understanding of it. And then I found out that frequently it was translated, you can actually find it a couple times, being buried. It's done, buried, gone, no longer there. Not like the night of the living dead where it comes back and grabs you on the ankle. 
but it's a um, it over it overwhelms it. If something gets overwhelmed, it's gone. A fervent love addresses the sin, doesn't overlook the sin. A fervent love transforms the sin, it doesn't tolerate the sin. Now, I know this is at odds with your, for the most part, most what most of you probably have is heard about this passage. But I would encourage you to look more closely at James 5, 19 and 20. You turn a person from their sin and cover over a multitude of sins. That makes sense? No turning, no covering. And then understanding our passage, if you love someone, a multitude of sins is no longer there. It's not just like one sin or the offense that they've given to you, it's like the whole gamut gets overdone. Then I have to ask the question, is this interpretation consistent with the rest of the concepts of love in Scripture? Love causes you to meet another's need. God was motivated by love. Christ was motivated by love in dealing with our sin problem. Not sweeping it under the rug, but dealing with it. So I maintain that the fruit of fervent love is not having a person show up at the judgment seat of Christ with lots of checked baggage full of sin, but show up purified with baggage full of things that God values. And towards that end, I ask the question, how does this fervent love actually cover over sin? How does it overwhelm it so that it is extinguished? How does it turn a person back to the truth? Well, this love is commanded, and uh, as I read through more of the New Testament, surprise, surprise, there are a bunch of other commands in the New Testament. According to Garrett, there are 614 of them. You have a list of these things. And if I'm following these commands, they should all kind of be consistent. And if I do these other commands, I will also be carrying out the command of love. Some of you are familiar with the series I did a little earlier on uh, New Testament ministries for garden variety Christians. And it was what kinds of things are we supposed to do with each other if we're not some sort of super saint, if we're not the Apostle Paul, if we're not Jesus, we're just, you know, common, pretty faithful. What do we do? So um, there's a list of them, and I've, I've done other stuff, so I have some verses that kind of deal with it. If you love someone, you can actually think of how this even works with a child. God treats us as his children and tries to do the same process. But he instructs or trains, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. He encourages, yeah, you can do it, this is, yeah, you can do it. Admonish, eh, you're not, not quite got it right. Look, we prove when you did that, you were missing it, and then you're doing it wrong. And then it goes two ways. You either withdraw or you restore. It goes either way at the end. So I'm going to take through these kind of ministries pretty quickly and take a look at this is how you demonstrate love towards another, particularly in turning them from the error of their way. So they do well at the judgment seat of Christ. It starts with training or instruction. And that's why the scriptures were given. The scripture was given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof that comes below, correction that comes below, training and righteousness, that the man of woman of God might be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, from Ephesians 2, you're saved to do good works. Those good works involve putting truth into someone else's life. And it starts with the scripture. Not our ideas about the truth, but what God has said and clearly revealed and proven throughout the New Testament. After this teaching or training, and I'll, you know, the pattern for a quiet time, you know, this is what the truth is, the path that you're supposed to walk on. Reproof shows you when you're off the path. Correction shows you how to get back on the path. And training helps you keep on the path. So, it's from the disciples of materials, basic elements of having a quiet time. So, we know what the truth says. And then God designed this thing called encouragement. Parakaleo, which I don't know who is the evil person who originally started preaching this as it means come alongside, because scores, hundreds, thousands of preachers have followed that same meaning. But if you just look at the word, it doesn't mean to come alongside, it means to call alongside. Para, parallel. Kaleo, 
call is to call alongside. And the imagery that they've given before is that of climbing up the mountain, calling others alongside you, saying, you can do it, being a model of the truth fleshed out in one's life, and then saying to others, this is what you're supposed to do. That is encouragement. I get vastly encouraged, particularly in praise time, when I hear how people are fleshing out the truth in their life. I see them climbing in the mountain, and it gives me desire and motivation to continue trotting the path, particularly when it gets steep and rocky, and other people throw stones at me. Paracleto is also sometimes translated exhort, uh, just the translator's choice of uh, using it in a more strong sense. So 2 Timothy 4, 2, a little right, like a handful of verses after 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul tells Timothy, in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back and is going to judge everybody, Timmy, preach the word. Be ready to do it when they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. And as you preach, reprove, rebuke, exhort, I forgot what translation I put up here, um, with all long patience or long-suffering, and doctrine, because the time's going to come when they don't want to hear it. So this is the encouragement. Then, if people still don't get it, you notch it up a little bit. You turn it back. And you admonish them. Admonish is basically to put in the right mind. And in 1 Thess 5.14, we exhort, parakaleo, you brethren, follow our example just as we have did to you, Admonish or warn the unruly. So an unruly is a person who's not walking the wall, uh, talk. A person who is out of line. And we, as garden variety Christians, without any special hocus pocus ordination or any other position or anything else, brethren are charged with warning each other when they're being unruly. And they're also charged with Parafabling the little sold. <laughs> what in the world are those folks? Um, King James probably put it, comfort the feeble-minded. I want somebody to comfort me. Okay, feeble-minded little one. It, it doesn't mean that. The word para is like our word for paraclau, alongside. And the word for, well, I translated here, fable, is a uh, or something like that. It's actually used of speaking someone to someone, normally of a fable. Aesop's fable time. You tell them a little story to get them motivated. It's a motivational word. It's not letting a person sit in the slow of this pond, or probably the cesspool of this pond, and saying, they're there now. It's okay. That's not fervent love. That's doing what's easy and natural. So we're supposed to Basically, encourage those who are a little sold or faint hearted, people who need the extra encouragement or kick in the appropriate <laughs> body part. And then uphold the weak. Now, that's the one that, you know, a person is weak, they're not strong. Uh, it actually sometimes is used of holding back a person who's doing the wrong thing. It's not one of your com more common translations, but the underlying Greek clearly allows for that. And be patient with all. Be long-suffering with all. That word is a great word. So there's the admonishment. And hopefully when a person is warned of the consequences of their action, you know, you hang out with that guy, you're going to go down the wrong path. They don't pay attention. They go down the wrong path. We now have the ministry of reproof. A word that's used frequently, uh, 44 times or so in the New Testament. And Reproof is bringing to light the situation. Jesus told us to do this in Matthew 18. If someone sins against us, go. Oh, you have to actually go. Yeah, go. And show him his fault. And if he hears you, you gain your brother back. You turn him from truth. Angels rejoice and everything's happy. But if he doesn't hear you, go get a couple more folks. And you guys go and talk to them. They still don't hear you, tell it to the church. So the whole church can say... Duh, you're doing the wrong thing. And if they don't hear, you know, the church just like, show what's really happening. They have no relationship with the body of Christ because they have no relationship with the head of Christ. Bye-bye until you repent. You're all familiar with Matthew 18, 15. Church discipline, one of the marks of a biblical church. 
in uh, John 3, just after he, John did, Jesus did John 3, 16, he explained why this ministry of reproof can be so difficult. Because the people who practice evil hate the light. They don't want to come to the light lest their deeds should be reproved or exposed. People don't want to see that they're doing wrong when they're doing wrong. And that's why it takes a purified love to keep on the task even if they don't want to hear it. Reproof is, um, you know, I kind of, when you're going down the wrong direction. Oh, I'm not going down the wrong direction. Well, when you did this and when you said that, doesn't that look like you're going down the wrong direction? If there is an other way of interpreting that data, let me know. I want to hear it. That's reproof. It's bringing to light the person's sin. So it can be seen as sin and it can be dealt with. Reproof is the exact opposite of sweeping under the rug for harmony. Think about that. If I'm obeying one of the 44 commands to reprove, I can't be covering over the sin by sweeping it under the rug. If I'm going to have a Bible and understanding of it that's logically consistent. So the thing that's got to give is your understanding of what it means to cover over a sin. It does not mean sweep it over the rug, it means to overwhelm it with truth and love. All right, they still don't get it, rebuke them. It's in the papyrus, this word means say no. Titus 1.13. The pastoral epistles are, have used these words a lot because they're instructing Timothy and Titus how to help people follow Christ in a church context. And Paul tells Titus that the Cretans, yeah, they're real lazy. They just do what comes naturally. La lazy gluttons, slow bellies, I think is the way King James puts it. They're slugs, spiritual sluggards. And he says, this testimony is true. Yep. All right, now what do we do about it? Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. Now, you don't start out with sharp rebuke. You start out at lower levels. And that's been one of our principles I've always taught, that you want people to learn at the lowest volume possible because that's the way you'd want to learn. You might even just share a verse out of your quiet time hoping in the edification group that the other person would recognize this is their real need. Or you may hear a sermon which, funny, a lot of them are targeted towards your needs. <laughs> Frequently people come back and say, man, are you going to read my diary? No, but God actually uses his truth to get across needs. So sometimes I'm surprised. Often I'm not because I usually see things and address them in sermons at a low level, but yeah, people still don't get it. But eventually the volume raises, the volume raises until it gets to the point where you've been through the admonishment, you've been through the reproof, people still don't get it, then you have to rebuke them sharply. And then, just like the debate season, it's almost over. <laughs> they're going to get it or they're not going to get it. If they get it, restore them, forgive them. Don't hold it over their head. That's appropriate. Get rid of it. It's dead, buried, gone. Let's start afresh. And this is what Paul had to say to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church were basically a carnal group of young believers who never quite got it. And he basically tells them in chapter, I mean, the first Corinthians, to exercise church discipline on this guy who's sleeping with his mom. And eventually the guy got excluded and repented and wants to come back. And the Corinthians don't even want to let him back in. No, 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 Corinthians get it all wrong. When they repent, when they acknowledge their sin and hopefully forsaken it or at least express the desire to forsake it, then they're back in. It says, forgive and encourage, lest the person be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Um, rebuke hurts. It's supposed to hurt. God designed it to make you sad, so you won't do whatever you're doing anymore. It's real simple. And then he says, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, and all is good again. On the other hand, they insist on being stupid, reject or withdraw. Paul tells Titus in chapter 3.10, reject someone who chooses their own way after the first or second admonition. <coughs> Shake the dust off your feet, sayonara Sam, it's over. If they repent, 
accept them back, but reject and withdraw so they feel bad. Second Thess 3.11, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him so that he may be ashamed. Make him feel badly. Actually, make him feel bad. Kind of feel badly means you can't really touch very well because your fingers are numb. You want to feel bad. It's one of those grammatical things that's tough. Anyway, you get to the point where the most loving thing you can do for someone is help them realize that, dude, you don't have a relationship with God. And therefore, you don't have a relationship with this body. And you need to repent. And when you repent, we accept you just like Christ accepted us. How did Christ accept us? I surrender, Lord. <laughs> I was wrong. Okay. Let's start all over again. That's a fervent love that we're supposed to have for each other. That's what Christ is going to ask when we get before the judgment seat. And I hope each one of us gets there not hiding a bunch of stuff under the carpet, but as Christ intended. I think it only happens as a result of fervent love, because as I mentioned in the beginning, the most noble, most valuable, most difficult things on this planet do not come naturally. You need God's supernatural energy, and His directions, His prescription, for making the thing happen. And then it'll work. <coughs> Sometimes. All right, questions? Yeah, Fiona. Uh, you know, I sometimes have a problem. Me, I have a problem that if I see someone may not do something right, but I always get a voice saying that you're not much better than the other person. What right do you have? Ah, the old you see someone doing something that's not right. And this little voice on your shoulder says, you're not as good as they are. Who are you to say? <laughs> he does a little voice a lot better than I do. Must come more naturally to him. Anyway. <laughs> you know what that little voice is? It's not the spirit of God. It's the spirit of Satan. Now, two issues on that. Even if we are not that much better, God has commanded. And God has also commanded, get your act together. So go get some help. Get your act together. Take a week. You know, basically, it does. So less than that. To just say, okay, yeah, whatever it is that's holding me back, I need to confess and forsake. Get some counsel, get some help, and then go do it. Now, there are young, some believers who basically think that uh, God's will is their will. Oh, I don't like that, so it's sin. But there's this forbearance, this long-suffering, you put up for a while. But who is it who would not want that person sanctified? The Spirit of God? Who is it who's the accuser of the brethren? The Spirit of God? No, it's Satan. So that little voice is probably not the same one that you hear regularly in your quiet time. You know, a doctor who smokes and has cancer and is way overweight, if he's got the right prescription, I'll take it. If I recognize that I could be dying from this thing, I don't care what kind of treatment I get, I want, I mean, who treats me, I just want to be treated. The trouble is the people who want to hide in darkness says, oh, well, who are you to tell me? Well, it's really not me telling you, you see. It's the word of God that says it, and I'm just the messenger. So if you have problems with what I'm saying, take it up with my boss. I'm just carrying out his orders. Other questions? Yeah, hands. I noticed up in the early quotes about the fervent love, almost all of the scriptures that you cited talked about brethren, each other, brethren. I could, it, it's only to relate to our relationship within the body, not so much to people outside the body. Am I reading too much in it? You are absolutely correct in that observation, although most of the world would probably not agree with you. You're right. <laughs> this is how we're supposed to interact with each other the commands. Garrett did the 613 commands, and he said less than a handful of them related to our dealings with folks outside the body. These are the way we're supposed to interact with each other. Does this make us too insular to attract both outsiders into the I'm just following directions. When I first, you know, after I get this worked out, I'll, you know, it's, it'll spill over. I'm not going to go around confronting everybody you see in the street. No, it's like a... <laughs> That's right. My thought on, on that, if we really carry out these commandments 
amongst each other. We look so attractive as a group of people that anybody who comes into contact with us says, wow, there's something special going on there. So you become very attractive to other people as a result. Isn't there a verse about that? That it's um, by your love for one another, they'll see that and glorify God? Yes. Um, John 15, by this will all men know my, you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Then, a couple of verses, chapters later, in John 17, Jesus prays that our love for each other would influence the world. And what, it's amazing how many people bypass the love for each other. Says, oh, we need to go out and love the world. No, no, no. Jesus said, first, love one another. When I get to heaven, Jesus is not going to ask me, well, Bill, how well do you love the world? Because I'll say, ha, plenty one, Lord. Your word said, don't love the world. <laughs> First John 2, 15. <laughs> nah, I probably won't say that. <laughs> but he's going to ask me, Bill, how have you loved one another? Reconcile that with the Great Commission. The Great Commission is go make disciples, teaching them to obey. That's going outside of your That's, body. No, it's actually, okay, it, so talk to Mr. Garrett there. <laughs> Garrett does the uh, end of that. A, a disciple is somebody who really obeys Christ. So that's the next step after believing Christ. So I, I would argue we have to do both. We have to go out and teach, uh, bring the gospel to people who don't believe. But the emphasis is really in most really The thing I love about Garrett's study is he has an empirical, irrefutable study of all the imperatives of the New Testament, the things that God commanded us to do, this over 600 things we are commanded to do. Now, where did God put his emphasis? Remember, the New Testament was written to believers. And then as you look at the bulk of the stuff, the purpose of the books are not to get people saved. The bulk of it, in the justification sense, the bulk of it is to get believers living so that God's glory can dwell within them. That's why Peter put this command in. After he gives the command being, you know, fervent in, uh, love for one another in chapter 1, he talks about that's the basis of being able to grow, newborn babes in chapter 2, and then being the temple in which God's glory dwells. If you want to see something that's attractive, it should be God's glory dwelling in the midst of his people. None of us are that attractive on our own. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's so wonderful. Yeah, but as a body of believers live in the harmony and unity that God has not only designed and commanded, God can dwell in our midst, and then people see it. So that's why God only gave a handful of commands for the outsiders, you know. Yeah, it's trying to fix the outside problems without having your own house in order. Definitely. So you you got to have the foundation right first before you can actually get affected outside. Um, if you think about a kind of discipleship uh, model, I would um, invest in two people who really become uh, reproductive disciples, who really focus on their spiritual walk together with God. Then they go out, and then they go out, and then they go out. It's much more effective than when I, as a person, try to reach a whole large group of non believers and, and have nothing uh, in the end to, to show. Yeah, Israel was not supposed to go out to battle without the presence of the Lord, symbolized by the cloud over the ark. So, I live in a world that uh, isn't exactly Christian. <laughs> there is a spiritual battle every day in this world, and uh, I would much rather go out with the presence and glory of God in a corporate body of believers in seeking to serve God. Other questions? Yeah, Vince. Um, Bill, you know, when you talk about Christians and you talk about love, I'll immediately want to focus on um, 1 Corinthians 13, because it's you know, it's a very big passage on love, and it has things like love suffers long and is kind, love does not envy, love does not pray itself, does not behave rudely, and, and so on. So given the fact that many people kind of run through this passage when trying to think about love, can you reconcile that with your bigger principles in the sermon? Sure, it's totally consistent. The manner in which you're supposed to love, and that's why I pop it on the bottom of your passage here, is with these things. The biggie is patience, long-suffering, because you got a lot of abuse. But I'd like you to notice the climax towards which Paul builds. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Uh, <laughs> I just have to call me All right. The climax towards which Paul builds in this is love rejoices in the truth. And then in verse 7, it's the coda at the end. He you know, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
But the thing towards which it builds is rejoices in the truth. Corinthian is written to the most carnal group of Christians. If you think about it, in the New Testament. It's like no Bible expositor would have another contender for yucky church except the Corinthians. <laughs> and in the midst of the passages on gifts and there's pride and there's self-centeredness and I'm better than you and all that other stuff, it says, none of that stuff that you guys have is worth anything. What matters is this. Now that was a letter that, that's not put in all the other letters to the church. It does say have a fervent love. But he had to spell out for these people aspects of love that it's other-centered, not self-centered. But all the other stuff is you know, clearly repeated. So this is not, you know, the fact that there's a lot of ink, it's because of the Corinthians need. Yeah? You know, a lot of the, uh, the commands are, are in the context of those who are mature, um, carrying out a lot of these uh, instructions, uh, encouraging a lot of improvement uh, to those who are uh, less mature. Uh, but it doesn't say here whether the reverse is true, where a person who's younger than me, because if they see something in somebody who's more mature than me, doing something that's not system that God has commanded, other than to say that for each other. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I don't think there's the hierarchy in these things. It says anyone. It's one another. We're all one in Christ. Peter viewed himself, as we're going to see in chapter 5, as just one of the guys, a fellow elder. It does say, you know, there's like one caveat. Don't receive an accusation against an elder unless you have a couple of witnesses. Other than that, you know, it's like um, the maturity, maturity level. I, I think some great teaching times come about, well, why'd you do that? And uh, then the person who's challenging might recognize, that's not something I'm supposed to be challenging. Or the person who's being challenged might realize, oh yeah, I need to make sure that I don't give an appearance of evil. But, yeah, Elaine. I want to talk a little bit about um, paratelio techniques, like calling alongside techniques. Um, so say, is, is using the words and those techniques you have in your question too? manipulation and persuasion, like can we use these sneaky behavior techniques with one another, saying like, you know, if you go the right way, I will reward you with them. You, know, you can do that as long as you take a shower the next morning. <laughs> it's Manipulation is considered a dirty word. However, let's think about it. If the only mean, and I, I am a big non-fan of manipulation. Persuasion actually can look a lot like manipulation. So if the only way I can get through to someone is to buy them an ice cream sundae and then talk to them, am I manipulating them? Am I persuading them? Am I, am I getting anything out of it? It's all about them. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for them. And that's what distinguishes the two. So to persuade someone, to encourage them, um, you do them a disservice by having all this encouragement, encouragement, but there's no path or truth that they need to walk on. If they're carrying this huge backpack of sin and they're struggling and you say, come on, you can do it, you can do it. That's like, depart and be in peace, be warm and filled and you don't do anything to help them. You manipulate someone when you use them for your benefit. You persuade someone when you are trying to get them to do what's in their best interest. So it's a very legit pair of technique to say, to the ward, to say, hey, if you walk in this direction, we will give you this, or do you know what Yeah, that's almost bribery. Yeah, yeah, so talk about these things. Whatever, it I mean, when you have kids, you don't want to become a bribing parent. Initially, you reward good behavior, you look for good behavior, you pray for good behavior, and then maybe they make a move in the right direction, and oh, that's wonderful, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so now, none of us wants to be treated like a baby <laughs> in the spiritual life, so don't look for that. Oh, you didn't encourage me enough, so that's why I'm a sinner. No, it's like, if you see the right behavior, express honest admiration and appreciation. Um, if a person's taking baby steps in the right direction, you're being a baby, okay, if that's what it takes, yay, you took a step in the right direction. <gasps> you didn't take a step in the wrong direction. Oh, good, good, good. You know, if, if that's what it takes, do it, because 
Otherwise, they're going to show up and it's not going to look good when they be for Christ. So you want to persuade them. Paul, you know, would do whatever it took. He said, I, I make myself a slave. I become all things to all men so I can save them. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. That's why you need God's grace, which is one of the things I put in here to actually do that, because if you have your own strength, you're going to burn out real fast. Is there food here? Or one more? Sure, Corey, go. Maybe this is a purity issue, but I still think it's a little tricky on the smaller things to identify sin versus your own preference of a behavior in the other person that you don't like or don't understand. And so can you maybe help figure out, I mean, some things are obviously drug sin, and some things are physical all right, you know, being purified and wanting what God wants, I, I think the Spirit of God, because He uses us in each other's lives, is going to guide us towards the right thing. But if a person hasn't really clued into how the Spirit of God works and willing and moving us to do His good pleasure, the safest thing to do is look for a clear biblical principle, correctly understood, which is being violated. Because reproof should be on the basis of the light of Scripture. And if you're going to bring up something that's, you know, say, well, this is what the Scripture says and this is what you're doing, how do those two match? Unfortunately, so little is actually that clear cut because we live in a world that's masterly confused by a really, really smart dude. And it, that's where you kind of need the wisdom, the collective wisdom of the body to help that. And ask you know, someone, do you think I'm just being a little selfish in this? Is this a legitimate preference? Should I address this issue? And that's why having a close relationship with another believer can help you see is this just being personal preference? Um, there's an issue I have here, and I'm not going to have time to get to it, on timing. Um, like, you, you have no idea what uh, what roles do timing and receptivity play in line three. That question always comes up in this kind of discussion. The scriptures tend not to address the issue of timing or receptivity. They just say, you address the issue. And if a person is receptive, not. But I think it is wise. I don't think it's wise like to address issues when a person is totally stressed out and everything else. <laughs> it's like treat them like you would want to be treated. But you know, eventually the issue still has to be dealt with. Our food's here. Yes. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you do love us. Um, thank you that in your wonderful, phenomenal, perfect love for us, you've designed things like the body. You've given us the ability and tools that we need to love one another fervently. You've given us the command to do it. I pray that we would be responsive and receptive to you, and that our love for each other would bring glory and honor to you. And people would reflect on, wow, how they love one another. May your spirit energize us towards that end. May Satan be defeated. Thanks for our food. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.